Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2023. This is a summer long reading event created by Vin at Revenant Reads a couple of read years ago, and he's assembled a whole bunch of BookTubers to talk about Star Trek all summer long. Uh, naturally, when you have an event like this, and when it's something like Star Trek that I love and have loved from the very beginning, uh, I'm going to be a little bit more prolific probably than some of my co hosts, but uh, all in good fun. I have been indulging in Star Trek reading. I'm going to continue to do that all summer long. I associate Star Trek and Star Trek books with the summer. Uh, and I don't know what I'm going to read ahead of time. I'm not pursuing any kind of plan. There isn't actually any kind of formal superstructure to this year's book trek. It's just the whole summer. A nice, lazy summer. We're two-thirds of the way through the summer. If you if you feel like reading a Star Trek book or rereading something, you are participating in book trek. I'm not following any kind of stricture. I'm just spinning the wheel. I have a lot of Star Trek novels. I'm just spinning the wheel and seeing what comes up. And if it's okay, if it, if the thing that just randomly I land on seems right, then I'll go with it. One of the things I've been trying to avoid just a little is massive rereading. Aside from a read-along of the novels of Sandra Marshak and Myrna Culbreth that I did with Randy Ray, the literate Texan. But aside from that, I have been trying to avoid rereading things that I've read a million times, and maybe even trying to avoid going to authors that I love, that I know already that I love. But uh, last night, no. <laughs> last night was a reread of a favorite. This was Flashback. This is a novelization by Diane Carey, who is my favorite Star Trek author. And it was from a, uh, the, a story by Brandon Braga that was done, of course, for Star Trek Voyager, the TV show. This is the novelization of a TV show episode of Star Trek Voyager. So when it comes to, we've, we've, we've commented before on this channel about the limits of pastiche fiction. If you were writing a Voyager novel, for instance, or a Star Trek The Next Generation novel back in the heyday when these things were coming out every month, I knew authors who did that, and they would submit their manuscript, and it would come back to them for secondary edits, and they didn't recognize the first 60 pages because... These shows had show Bibles and all sorts of things that you could or could not do. They were heavily strictured. By the time Paramount knew that they had millions and millions of dollars locked up in this, you couldn't just haul off and write a Star Trek book. And unfortunately, you still can't. And I say unfortunately because limiting authors like that for a type of entertainment that no one indulges in, no one reads, <laughs> outside of BookTube, no one reads. Limiting authors like that when it's no one cares, no one thinks this is official, no one is, is holding you to any of this, no, no one's going to exercise any kind of legal rights. You've, it's only going to hurt you. You might as well, especially with, with old franchises, you might as well say to authors, do your worst. Write whatever weird or wild or detailed thing you want. And fans, we, if fans don't like it, we can just say, well, it's the book universe. It's the same thing as the Star Trek, the Star Wars expanded universe. You, no one's beholden to it. You can you can like it or consider it quote unquote real or not at your pleasure. Uh, Star Trek doesn't do that, and I don't think they ever will. But it, so as a result, the people who write Star Trek novels are incredibly constricted in what they have to do. They they are essentially movie adaptation novels where the writer doesn't invent any of the characters, at least none of the major characters. They're not allowed to go off reservation and write entirely about characters who are in the continuity but have never been seen on the small screen or the big screen. They're not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to kill any character. They're not allowed to inconvenience any character. They're not allowed to maim or marry any character. They're not allowed to do anything. They can't. They can barely do anything. They can move around some of the throw cushions on the furniture, but they can't even move the furniture. It's a very limiting way to write pastiche fiction just in general is unless you're unless you're doing it sub rosa on a site like fanfiction.net where literally anything goes but if you're doing it under the the rubric of a publishing arm of the studio that owns the property their lawyers are going to be watching what you do and and limiting what you do and if writing pastiche fiction for a star trek series is that limiting then imagine how much more limiting it is to write pastiche fiction to write an adaptation of a movie script or a tv script of that show even more restrictive good lord 
as you can tell from the cover, this is a Star Trek Voyager episode in which Captain Janeway and Lieutenant Tuvok meet, in heavy air quotes, Captain Sulu of the Excelsior, that pot-bellied Star Trek, right? The starship right there is the, the USS Excelsior. In the movie version, in the, in the canonical Star Trek movies, Sulu becomes the captain of the Excelsior. Uh, a big new ship, uh, not so big as her captain, I think. <laughs> he has a crew, and he has uh, a couple of great moments in in uh, Star Trek: the the Final Frontier, uh, and presumably lots and lots of experiences, lots lots of, of adventures of his own. And in this episode, it becomes canonical that Luke, that Tuvok. In his first career in Starfleet, he was in Starfleet as a young Vulcan, and then he left Starfleet for a long time, had a family, thought that it was not for him, and then he returned. So Tuvok, Vulcans live a very long time, for those of you maybe who aren't Star Trek fans who are watching this, although why you would, I don't know. So Tuvok served on the crew of the Excelsior under Captain Sulu. He met Kirk, he met Spock during the, the, the time of the Kittimer Accords. He had adventures on a starship with Captain Sulu. And then he left Starfleet, was gone for a long time, and then served on Voyager with Captain Janeway. <laughs> uh, so Tuvok is a living bridge between the one era of Star Trek and the other. Kind of amazing. Uh, and this, in this episode, a, a, a weird alien entity is doing something to Tuvok's memories. It's it's traumatizing him through memories of things that never happened to him, through him as a boy losing his grip on a girl on a ledge and letting her fall to her death. Tuvok doesn't know that memory. He doesn't have that's not one of his memories. And it, the 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 episode is a little bit convoluted. They, they eventually he decides to mind meld with Janeway to try and figure out what's going on so that she can guide him through the process. Uh, he chooses her because she's his closest friend, not just on Voyager, but anywhere. They do it over the doctor's advice, of course. He doesn't trust Vulcan mind melds any more than Bones McCoy did. And this takes Tuvok back in his memories, but not to the girl at the cliff. Instead, it takes him back to his memories on board the Excelsior. And the, the uh, Voyager showrunners got George Takai to reprise his role as Captain Sulu. And Janice Rand is back. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense why this alien would bring them here. It's just necessary because you've got George Takai, because he can come back to the show. He can reprise his role as Sulu. So at one point, the whole mind meld process goes wrong, and not only is Janeway back in Tuvok's memories on board the Excelsior in his first, in his first career at Starfleet, but also, in a weird twist, Sulu becomes aware of them. <laughs> he becomes he becomes aware of them on his bridge, of Janeway on his bridge. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, and it, if you go with that, you get a, a really terrific episode. It'll, it Certainly, it gives Janeway an opportunity to opine about the original series to Harry Kim, to Ensign Kim, saying, you know, the space must have seemed a lot a lot bigger than Romulans behind every nebula. She, at one point, she says to Harry Kim that sometimes she wishes that, that she daydreams about riding with that crew in those kind of Old West days. But she also, in that scene, says a line that had Star Trek fans quite an uproar. <laughs> it, it splintered the dilithium crystals, and mine included. She says, of course, the whole lot of them would be booted out of Starfleet today. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Captain Bun of Steel. I think your Starfleet would benefit a lot from Jim Kirk. <laughs> but, uh, uh, of course, that line drives me nuts. It, it does even now. I love the episode, and that line still drives me nuts. This episode shows Tuvok on board the Excelsior with Captain Sulu. It, we reprise a, a great scene. Uh, from Star Trek The Undiscovered Country, from from uh, where the Klingon moon Praxis explodes, Su uh, George Takai gets to reprise not only his role as Sulu, but that particular scene. And also, oddly, 
the showrunners just making trouble for themselves where no trouble need be, Michael Ansara reprises his role as Klingon Commander Kang. And it's great. It's just a minute. It, it's, it's You blink and it's over. But he has the gigantic Klingon head ridges when Kang in the original series did not have those head ridges. So, you know, is he had work done? <laughs> uh, it's... It's a wonderful exchange between the two of them. You get the impression, which is good, that Sulu and Kang have had encounters after Kang's encounter with the Enterprise in the original series. You get the impression of, even if you, if you use your imagination just a little, of old enemies, old frenemies, old cautious sparring partners, which is terrific. You, you actually, I think, you get that impression between Kirk and Commander, the Klingon Commander Koloff in The Trouble with Tribbles. They cl I think they clearly act like they've known each other before, like they've dealt with each other before. Here, you get that same kind of feeling with, with Sulu and Kang, where, where Kang's warship has Sulu's Excelsior dead to rights, and, and Kang says to him, it's good to see that they've finally given you the command you richly deserve. Do not let it end prematurely, <laughs> which is awesome. The, the actor does a great job as Kang. Before he appears again, on uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine and ends his his role as Kang. Uh, and also, it, there's a great uh, toss-off line where S Sulu says, nice to see you again. And Kang's just, he just fumes. You don't say those sorts of pleasantries to cling on to, <laughs> of a certain generation anyway. Uh, and Sulu also has a wonderful moment with Lieutenant Tuvok where he tells him, if you're going to tell me that Vulcans don't have a sense of humor, save it, I know better. Quite good stuff in here. Quite good moments. It, the, the overall story doesn't make any sense. Uh, no matter what, it just doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any more sense in this book. Diane Carey is really good at this sort of thing. She's really good at taking pre-existing material, preset parameters in terms of the words of a script, and still making them, fleshing them out, making them feel like you're getting more. Like you're getting more than just the screenplay. She does that often for Voyager, for Deep Space Nine, for Star Trek The Next Generation. She does that often. I would I would love it if if she were allowed to do that for, like, in my dream idea, if she were allowed to do that for each individual episode of the original series, I would be in seventh heaven. <laughs> but uh, Or somebody, if somebody were allowed to do that. This could be done for every episode of Star Trek, in every franchise, up until Kurtzman Trek. This could be done for every episode. There should be a book for every episode of Star Trek. It shouldn't just be, hey, you know, Pocket Books and Paramount are pushing this episode to make back the money of spend that they spent on George Takai. So we it shouldn't so we're gonna make a book and we're gonna make a big deal out of it. It shouldn't just be that. It should be every episode. We shouldn't have to it's been fifty years, sixty years. We shouldn't have to settle for the only written version of a mock time being James Blish's version. That anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, you've heard that rant before. This was this was very enjoyable. It took I don't know, I think three and a half minutes to read. <laughs> but that was my, that's my book track report for today, is I read Flashback again. I absolutely had no call to do so, but I did. <laughs> and I'm not apologizing, I had a blast. I might even watch the episode again. It, I could easily do that. I, can, I know the episode backward or forward, but I might watch it again anyway. Uh, but anyway, that's my book track report for today. I will be back, uh, and I will see you then. Thank you, BookTube.